It has been said that there was hardly any art in England before the days of the great Sir Joshua Reynolds. Born on the 16th of July, 1723, Reynolds lived the life of an ordinary country boy. He loved to ride and shoot, and he never lost his strong Devonshire accent, nor did he attempt to disguise his provincial background. From a young age, Reynolds showed both the talent and determination to succeed as an artist, and in 1740 he was apprenticed to Thomas Hudson. Many claim that Hudson simply could not teach him. Perhaps more importantly than teaching Reynolds to paint was the society to which Hudson introduced him. This was the age of celebrity, and it was from Hudson that Reynolds learnt the importance of wooing the aristocracy. If Hudson's teaching divides opinion, the influence of the artist William Gandhi does not. Reynolds regularly visited Exeter, and he never passed through the city without studying the portraits of William Gandhi. James Northcott, pupil and biographer of Reynolds, states that in his early practice, Reynolds adopted Gandhi's manner in regard to painting the head, and retained it to some degree ever after. Reynolds spent the next six years in Plymouth. Among his early supporters were Lord and Lady Edgecombe. It was at their house in the spring of 1749 that Reynolds met Commodore Keppel. The meeting with Keppel gave Reynolds the opportunity to travel, and on the 11th of May 1749, Reynolds set sail for the Mediterranean to study the works of the old masters. Reynolds was much delayed by a riding accident in Menorca. Falling from his horse, his face was so badly injured that part of his lip had to be removed, leaving his face permanently scarred. Later in the Vatican, while copying Raphael's, he caught a chill that brought about the deafness that was destined to be a lifelong infirmity. Nevertheless, when Reynolds returned to England in 1752, he was armed with the weapons of Michelangelo, Raphael, Titian, Rubens and Rembrandt. Commissions now came in such quantity that in 1755 his sitting book records 150 sitters. The boldness of Reynolds' youthful attempts totally confounded the old painters of the time who still idolised the late Godfrey Neller. In 1768, the Royal Academy was established and George III approved Reynolds' election as president. Reynolds was determined to raise the standard of British painting, as seen by the archers, inspired by Reynolds' admiration for Titian. Reynolds painted this portrait in August, a month he'd reserved for personal projects, suggesting Reynolds instigated the portrait, undoubtedly with an eye to the newly established Royal Academy exhibition. This immense double portrait shows Lord Sidney on the left and Colonel John Dyke Ackland leaping forward on the right. The painting celebrates the men's friendship. However, after the portrait was exhibited in 1770, the friends quarrelled and each declined to pay for it. For many years the painting remained in Reynolds' studio, till the executors of Colonel John's will paid £300 for it in June 1779. The portrait remained in the family, primarily at Tetton House in Somerset, before it was purchased by the Tate in 2005. Our portraits of Colonel John Dyke Ackland and Lady Harriet probably celebrate their 1770 wedding. Colonel John fought in the American War of Independence, where he was shot in both legs. Lady Harriet accompanied her husband on his military service and showed remarkable courage. Not only did she insist on following her husband as the campaigning progressed, but she crossed the River Hudson into enemy territory to nurse her prisoner of war husband for nine weeks. Tragically, Colonel John died shortly after his return to England in 1778. Legend has it that Colonel John challenged Lieutenant Lloyd to a duel after Lloyd spoke poorly of the Americans, who had shown great kindness to John during his captivity. Colonel John survived the duel and rode back home to Teton the following morning, but the damp chill of a November dawn finished the work that the American bullets had begun. Reynolds' greatness was that he worked in collaboration with a sitter to create a pictorial fiction. Reynolds applied a simple method of referring to the sitter's achievements through the pose and accessories, painting not only the face, but the life and soul of the sitter. Our portrait of Sir Thomas Dyke Ackland's seventh baronet of Colum John is a fine example of this. In 1767, Sir Thomas became a reluctant MP for the second time. This relaxed and sporting portrait was painted as a reassurance to his friends and family that his heart remained very much in Devon. Sir Thomas was clearly at pains to promote his image publicly in 1767, as he also paid Reynolds for a near duplicate of our portrait that can be seen at Saltram House. 
Although changes to the foliage, tree and costume in the portrait at Killerton suggest that this portrait was used to work out the final composition, it is by no means a sketch and is just as highly finished as the second portrait at Saltram. Despite Reynolds's greatness, he has been accused of reckless experimenting, with Sir Walter Armstrong stating, Speaking roughly, Sir Joshua's early pictures darken, the works of his middle period fade, those of his late maturity crack. Reynolds was certainly a maverick, but he was only interested in progress. Every picture of his was an experiment of art made by an ingenious man, and even where he failed, such experiments helped to advance art. From 1752 to 1792, there is no doubt that Reynolds achieved more than was ever achieved by any single artist in any age or any country. The often quoted encouragement from Sir George Beaumont sums it up. Take the chance. Even a faded picture from Reynolds will be the finest thing you ever have. In mid-July 1789, Reynolds' left eye clouded over as he painted at his easel. He laid his brush to one side and stated with the quiet dignity that never deserted him throughout his life, all things come to an end. I have come to the end of mine. Within weeks, the eye was totally blind. Reynolds would never paint seriously again.